Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thanks for the kind words. Let me jump right into this lecture because I'm covering a lot of ground with it. Um, I start off with two of my favorite quotations here. Uh, the first one from Nassim Taleb is indicating that it's what, when you change a system in some way or another, uh, something can go wrong, and often the things that go most terribly, most terribly wrong. A little louder. Okay. Uh, when you change institutions or you change policies, some things can go wrong, and some of the things that go most terribly wrong uh, are things that we don't envision even going wrong. Sort of un sometimes called unknown unknowns, and this field is full of them. Uh, so uh, this is a kind of a talk that's a sort of a, an economist's apology, an apology why we can't come out with firm, crisp answers about how much to spend or what exactly to do uh, in the case of climate change. Now, I want to start off by spending a little time, I hope it won't take up too much, is, is saying where I am coming from, how I am looking at this, uh, at this problem. And I start with this famous uh, uh, graph. Uh, uh, in Antarctica, they have drilled down to uh, uh, ice cores down to 800,000 years ago. And within these ice cores are little bubbles of air from uh, each year or each decade. And uh, they, we can analyze pretty exactly the carbon dioxide content of these bubbles going back for 800,000 years. And then on the upper axis is put the temperature deviations uh, as a function of how long before the present uh, we go back to. Um, this is a little less accurate because it's gotten by proxy data, basically oxygen isotope ratios. This is as good a data there is in paleoclimate right here. Now, what do we see? We see that for 800,000 years, cli climate temperature has almost never gone above 280 uh, parts per million. At the, uh, just before the Industrial Revolution, we were at 280 parts per million, so we were in a warm spell uh, around here. Uh, now, where are we now? We're now at 400 parts per million. That's somewhere up here where the word Holocene is. And if we count the other greenhouse gases in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent, it's at least 450, and that would place it up here somewhere. So you can see this is a tremendous change uh, geologically in a very short period of time and is way outside the normal range. If we continue something like business as usual without constraining carbon dioxide flows strongly, we haven't seen this much of a change of carbon dioxide this fast for maybe 50 million years ago, maybe at the so-called PETM period, uh, maybe more than 50 million years ago. So we're dealing with an event that on a geological scale is huge, is representing a huge change. Now, uh, we, uh, you can see here, you don't have to be a statistician to see the very high degree of correlation between the temperature change and the carbon dioxide content uh, of, the, of the atmosphere. Uh, well, what is causing what? It, either way is worrisome uh, because if this carbon dioxide increase is causing the temperature increases, that's what we're worried about. Suppose though it's the other way around, and as a matter of fact, if you disaggregate this data enough, it looks almost like it's the other way around, that the temperature change is preceding the carbon dioxide. Maybe that's even worse because that indicates some very bad feedback that once it gets a little warmer, it releases somehow carbon dioxide. That makes it still warmer. That releases more carbon dioxide. And we, don't, we understand this process less well. So either way, this looks like a, uh, this looks like a, uh, a, worrisome, uh, a worrisome picture. And it's indicative of the fact that there is deep structural uncertainty about what is going to happen when we get way outside, way outside this range. Now. Uh, uh, let me, let me uh, look now at, what, uh, at this uncertain aspect and try to make it a little bit more precise. Uh, 
Um, the, in, in, in climate science, one of the most iconic numbers is something called climate sensitivity, and that tells us basically the, what would happen to temperatures for a doubling of carbon dioxide. Right. Actually, this is for each doubling, it's the same, it's, it should be roughly the same number. Uh, based, the IPCC AR5 description of climate sensitivity is that the likely range is one and a half degrees centigrade to four and a half degrees centigrade. This is the same likely range as 35 years ago uh, on the beginning of scientific investigations of this. So this number, ha this uncertainty associated with this number has not changed. It's one of these situations, I guess, where when you make more, pre when you understand better one aspect, then it comes into light that there's another aspect that matters uh, that you haven't taken account of. That's a very wide range between one and a half and uh, four and a half degrees. And uh, the details are in that book on climate shock, but basically we, I tried to fit a curve to this, a log normal distribution to be technical, so we could then discover what is the median temperature change and what is the probability of a temperature change greater than or equal to six degrees centigrade associated with each carbon dioxide uh, concentration number. And let me look at, highlight three things. Why six degrees? Well, I picked that as an absolute catastrophe. Somehow that would be civilization altering, it would threaten the human race, it would upend uh, everything. Uh, so I'm perfectly purposely picking this as, as extreme. Now we are now at 450 parts per million, uh, increasing at about two parts per million per year and accelerating in increasing. So the, the median temperature associated with that would be 1.8 degrees, less than this kind of iconic two degrees centigrade. So looking a bit on the safe side, but the probability of, out in this tail of being greater than or equal to six degrees is 0.3 percent, a low number, but not that low considering that this is an absolute catastrophe. Now let's look at 550. 560 would be a doubling of pre-industrial level uh, carbon dioxide. So this looks like, this 550 looks at, like, uh, uh, looks like the world, uh, it looks like the climate sensitivity curve itself. So again, the median is two and a half degrees centigrade. The probability of being greater than or equal to four and a half degrees centigrade is 10%. I don't have it in here, but it is 10%. The probability of being greater than six degrees is 3%. So notice what's happening. The, as we go up in concentrations, excuse me, as we go up in concentrations, the median goes up, but gradually. As we go up in concentrations, the probability of being in this extreme catastrophic tail goes up and goes up pretty rapidly because we're moving into, uh, into the tail. Uh, where will we end up? Nobody knows, of course, but uh, uh, s s some, uh, uh, the International Energy uh, agency projects that we will, that their guess is that we will likely end up at around 700 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent before leveling off. That would give an 8 percent, I'm sorry, that would give an 11 percent chance of, a, of a, a temperatures, greater, changes greater than or equal to 6 degrees. Okay, so this, this is sort of where I'm coming from that the part of the ch climate change uh, as, as measured by, as indicated by temperatures, uh, the part of climate change that's really scary is this tail of extremes. The median is not so, so, so worrisome. It's the extremes, it's the low probability, rare events uh, that are becoming more and more scary as they're increasing in probability. And that unfortunately goes up quite rapidly as uh, the carbon dioxide concentrations uh, increase. Okay, now, uh, let me check. all right, why is 
climate change economics so difficult and so controversial? In a way, this is mirroring the science. There's just huge amounts of uncertainty out there. We're unsure about what the outcomes are going to be. And the more carbon, the higher the carbon dioxide concentrations, the more unsure are we about what are the, uh, what are the consequences. So, why is this more problematic than other applications? We use cost-benefit analysis to analyze whether a bridge should be built, whether a highway should be widened, agricultural policies, health policies. All right, the problem here is that in every aspect of climate change economics, we're pushing the limits of this economic analysis. It's built upon assumptions, and the assumptions are becoming uh, more and more questionable as we push further and further into these, uh, into these tales. So look, I'm going to try to give uh, uh, a rundown on what are the various special difficulties associated with the economics of climate change. Uh, what we really want to know is how much should we be spending on uh, abating carbon dioxide levels? A lot, a little, an intermediate amount? It's very difficult to say. So here's some aspects that make climate change especially difficult. Uh, the time element. It's in geological terms, what's happening is almost instantaneous. So it's happening very rapidly, which causes a lot of the uncertainty. But on human time scales, it's, come, it's spreading across generations and centuries and even millennia of time. It's very difficult for people to conceptualize. It, 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 it's like no other problem that way that we've confronted. Uh, it, the, the, people see this as a remote, distant future problem. It's not felt at a grassroots level, at the level of popular uh, uh, imagination. Uh, the attribution is difficult. It's difficult yet to say which events, which weather events now are being caused by climate change. This, the, the, most of them are consistent with, uh, a strong, with a big climate change policy, but we still can't attribute, we still have difficulty attributing any one event to climate change, although there are some that are uncontroversial, like the rise, the the very strong rise in sea levels which is, uh, which is taking place. So it's a human tendency to put off actions until the emergency is arriving. Um, you say, why bother with this? This is decades and generations and centuries off. We got problems right now that are affecting people. Why bother with this thing that's so far, uh, far in the future? Um, now, here I have a question. Are climate change catastrophes endogenous? Uh, well, here's an argument, a pessimistic argument, why they might be. That why it might be that it's not whether we will, uh, uh, whether it's not, the question is not whether or not we will perceive a climate change catastrophe, but when will we perceive it? Because if nothing really is done until there is a feeling that something catastrophic is arriving with uh, climate change, then what happens is this year you have very mild restraints. A decade later you revisit it, there still is not the perception of a catastrophe. You still have mild responses. The only way in which you get a very strong uh, response uh, that would prompt uh, a change in international governance of some sort would be if there really were a widespread perception of something catastrophic due to climate change. And then it's not a question of whether or not there is such a perception, but when such a perception appears. I emphasize it's the perception that matters. Uh, if everybody uh, perceives that the climate change is doing something awful, that's enough. Whether it is or it isn't, it plays some role, but only in people's uh, perceptions. All right, now along with the very, uh, the very long periods of time, uh, 
this discounting issue becomes humongous because everyone knows how compound interest causes things to grow over long periods of time. An analysis of what to do about climate change involves, again, centuries, generations, millennia. And so the discount rate that you choose almost determines the answer. Sometimes we say that the biggest uncertainty in climate change economics is the uncertainty about what discount rate to use. For example, there was a, there is a, there was a recent uh, uh, finding within the U.S. government among a m bunch of different committees, uh, a bunch of different agencies uh, that combined uh, to uh, research uh, the cost of carbon. Uh, so how much is it costing us uh, for each ton of carbon dioxide that is being emitted into the atmosphere? And they used three models. And you can, you can, you can read about this. The, the congressional committee used a 3% discount rate. And they came up with a number. I'm sorry, I don't have the slide on that. They came up with a number of $40 per a ton of carbon dioxide is what the damages are going to be in present discounted terms. Now, if they had used the, the rate of return on capital, on average, the real rate of return on capital is closer to 7%. So if they had used that as a discount rate, the social cost of carbon would be $2. So it goes from $40 to $2 if you increase the discount rate from 3% to 7%. What is the lowest conceivable discount rate? Well, it would be something like the rate of return on safe government bonds. Let's, and that's about 1% per year. If you use 1% per year, the social cost of carbon dioxide was $480. So it's $40 for 3%, $480 for 1%, and $2 for 7%. So you can see it's the nature of the problem that depending on what you use as a discount rate, you get a, a, a cost of carbon that's either very high or very low. Um, so there's been a lot of work on this. It, it, what difference does it make? A huge difference. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about what discount rate ought to be used uh, for such a long-term uh, event that's account that's uh, cutting across generations. And I don't know how to escape this problem. I think you know we we know now what the uh, there's enough research that we understand what's the consequences of various discount rates, uh, but this, it's not helping us very much with what the choice of discount rates uh, is supposed to be. Um, there's now work, for example, there's, there's a general agreement that if you have a lot of uncertainty and the discount rates, you don't know the future discount rate, you know the past discount rates, but there's no deep reason that we can extrapolate that. There's not a law of nature that the rate of return on capital be 7% or 1% or whatever it is. It's just what happened in the past, seemingly. There's a lot of work that shows now that if you don't really know what the future, uh, what the, if you don't know what the future uh, discount rate is, you're uncertain about that, that the schedule you actually use ought to be a, a family of declining discount rates that decline down to the lowest possible number. So about this there is uh, some agreement, but it still leaves a lot of room. Uncertainty. There are huge structural uncertainties everywhere. Uh, where, uh, uh, and the probabilities that are involved are, are ambiguous and fuzzy. I gave an example before of climate sensitivity, and we're unsure what that is. The, the IPCC attempts to quantify that uh, by s saying that uh, likely means uh, be somewhere between 66% probability and 90% probability um, in that uh, curve that we fitted, uh, we split the difference and said that there's a 78% a, a probability of being within one and a half and four and a half degrees. But th th this isn't based on frequentist 
probabilities that we observe. Like we have a number of year, centuries and even millennia, if you can uh, take verbal descriptions of what earthquake damages are, what the distribution looks like. We don't have any such frequency data for climate change. It's a one-off event. Uh, models, different models predict different outcomes. Uh, but we, we can't point to some event in the past that grinds out a probability distribution. Now, why does it, why does it make everything more difficult? Well, the, it's a one-off event. The public hates uncertainty. The average person doesn't like being uncertain about an important thing like this. And they hate even more subjective uncertainty because that's what somebody thinks or what some committee thinks is the, uh, is the appropriate probability. And uh, there's a widespread misconception, I would say, that uh, uh, there's a widespread misperception that what science means is something exact. So as the science develops, we will get more and more exact numbers for climate sensitivity or for the frequency of, or, or intensity of hurricanes. That's not necessarily the case. I mean, the, the, the science can stall out and say the best we can say is that it's going to be, it's likely to be between one and a half and four and a half degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, so this makes everything different, difficult. The public, it's difficult for them to conceptualize this. It's subjective. It's something that's coming out of models and out of modelers' perceptions. Uh, politicians don't like this either. It, the, the normal human reaction to uncertainty with a small probability and a very bad consequence is either to exaggerate the consequence, to say this is so important that we have to throw away everything else and concentrate on this immediate catastrophic problem, or else to say, well, the probability is so low that we can disregard it. That's sort of a normal human approach, I would say. And this is asking us to face head on this problem of uncertainty and that we have to make decisions under uncertainty and under the worst kind of uncertainty, uh, subjective uncertainty. All right, here's another issue, the global public good issue. Um, uh, uh, carbon dioxide concentrations, which are what matters, the stock of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a public bad, right? It's bad. Uh, it's, 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 it, it, uh, it's, this has been described as the biggest global public goods problem of all time. The problem is with these kind of public goods, uh, everyone wants the free ride. The U.S. wants China to voluntarily cut its output of carbon dioxide, and China wants the U.S. to uh, cut back on its emissions of carbon dioxide and everybody wants everyone else to do something. They're not taking account, they're not internalizing the externality, they're not internalizing uh, in their own calculations uh, the fact that, uh, that this is a, 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 a big uh, problem. Now, we have public goods problems within countries, uh, things like uh, uh, national defense or, uh, um, or, or how many fire stations uh, we should have or weather reports. These are all public goods where nobody wants to pay for the full cost of knowing what the weather is going to be uh, tomorrow, but collectively we would uh, pay a huge amount. Um, Countries, to some extent, one famous theory of government is that governments exist primarily to take care of these externalities, to make a collective choice on behalf of everybody uh, in society. And this is a much more serious problem because there is no one government. There is no international government. Nations are sovereign. And some, if there's a solution to this problem, a, a good solution is going to have to probably involves setting up some sort of international agency that uh, an international climate assembly or something like that that votes on what the price of carbon should be or votes on uh, carbon policy. We don't have any such thing. Right now in international law, governments are, are sovereign. So 
this is a huge problem that we that no one country uh, can solve. Uh, and you need an international agreement, you need to have verification, you need to have enforcement and penalties, none of that exists at the current time. So all of that would need to be created out of, out of whole cloth. Here are some other problems. What are the costs? Okay, this actually is probably one of the better known uncertainties. We're still pretty highly uncertain, but compared with these other things, this is not that so, so, so problematical. So how do you predict or project costs? There's an acute problem of predicting technological change when you go outside the familiar range. I mean, the familiar range is we know about uh, nuclear generation of electricity, for example. It's done, most of France's, uh, it's, it's been done and constructed. Most of France's uh, electrical power is coming from, uh, from nuclear. Uh, when we go to unknown technologies like uh, uh, wind or solar power, uh, we're much less sure what the costs are, what the eventual costs are going to be, and whether these technologies can be scaled up. Okay, a bigger problem is what are the damages, and this is a huge problem. How do you estimate damages from climate change? What is even the functional form? Is it, is it that the effect of climate change, increasing temperatures, is as if part of gross domestic product is, be, is evaporated? That would be a multiplicative uh, kind, of, uh, kind of a functional form. Or is it additive? Does it somehow add its disutility to the utility of normal consumption? And a lot is riding on such things as what is the functional form that's typically taken to be multiplicative. But, uh, and the answers that we get depend upon this. Uh, the multiplicative form where climate change is showing up as if so, a part of that national output uh, disappeared, uh, sort of evaporated, uh, that makes climate change look less serious because if we can have growth, if we can have economic growth at 2% per capita per year, that will outstrip even very big damages uh, 100 years uh, from now. Okay, and when uh, what about including uh, the in nature and biodiversity and things like that? We economists don't have a good metric for that sort of thing. We can put in artificial numbers uh, and see what happens, but we have no market equivalent of these kinds of things. Uh, and high temperature damages are particularly problematic. As we get into the high concentrations of carbon dioxide and the high temperatures that they cause, it becomes almost impossible to say what the damages would be. What's typically done in practice in these so-called integrated assessment models, which are uh, uh, combinations of a models of economic, simple models of economic growth with simple models of the uh, geophysics of, uh, uh, of temperature change, what is typically done is to try to pin down what the cost would be, let's say, for a two degree temperature change. And we can get a handle on that. You'd have to build dikes higher. You'd have to evacuate people from certain places. Uh, you'd have to do various things. So they have some handle on what the very roughly the cost might be. But when you get to four degrees centigrade, five degrees centigrade, six degrees centigrade, it's anyone's guess and these black swans are gonna be out there in the form of unknown unknowns. Uh, and I don't see quite how to uh, get any more precise on, on, on damages for high uh, temperatures. What's done now is just to extrapolate, just fit a curve between zero and two degrees centigrade, estimating what the damages are at two degrees centigrade. The damages at zero degrees centigrade change are, z are zero, and then fit a quadratic or some other kind of curve there and extrapolate it. The problem is that you can fit between zero and two degrees all kinds of curves, exponential, quadratic, whatever, and when you go to four degrees, it will depend upon what the functional form is that you are extrapolating, uh, and that's 
just done in an ad hoc way right now. What is welfare? Okay, we have a kind of a standard economist answer for, for standard cost-benefit analysis uh, type events. Um, uh, but we don't know that we can trust this uh, standard analysis of welfare. Usually you try to assume that, okay, there's a uh, representative agent that's representing the entire economy. There's, if, it's, if there is such a representative agent, we would look at the effect on the representative agent, how much the representative agent would be willing to play, uh, would be willing to pay. This isn't a great, it's not a great assumption even on the level of a country. But when it's on an international level, it's a, it's a bad assumption. And how do you compare uh, welfare effects on Bangladesh with welfare effects on Italy? Uh, um, we don't know. It's going to have different effects on different regions and countries. We're not sure how to aggregate that. Uh, there's controversy about whether the intergenerational aspect makes a difference or not. Should we somehow be weighting the welfare of this generation higher than the next generation, or should it be equal? You get different answers and different discount rates depending on what assumptions you make. Finally, on my list here, which could be extended, I wouldn't say indefinitely, but could be doubled at least, there's very strong irreversibilities, which means once we go down a certain path, we can't take it back. Um, if if the climate, the the uh, uh, welfare effects of climate change uh, depend upon the stock of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, not the flow. So there are externalities like part of particulate pollution that are flow externalities. If you cut off the flow, then you almost immediately cut off the problem. This thing, you could cut the flow down to zero and you still will go on increasing temperatures because uh, the, it's like a bathtub where you've turned on the spigot uh, and the, bath, the water in the bathtub rises and now you suddenly cut down on the spigot. It will not, the stock will take a long time to work its way down. Um, so. Once underway, climate change is very difficult to reverse. There's estimates out there that, roughly speaking, uh, of carbon dioxide levels above 280, we're at 400 now, of carbon dioxide levels above 280, after 100 years, about 70% will remain in the atmosphere. After uh, 1,000 years, about 40% will remain in the atmosphere because what's happening to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is, some, is a combination of some very complicated processes, each of which have a different half-life, uh, so to speak. Um, if it were reversible, we could wait and see. You know, we could, if it, if it just could be reversed as a flow, we'd wait. If there's a catastrophe, we'd cut the flow. Here, though, it's a stock externality, and if you cut the flow, you're still going to have the same amount of stock there, only slowly declining over time. So uh, this is uh, uh, an, a huge issue here. And uh, it, uh, can we learn enough about impending catastrophes in time to act? I don't know. Nobody knows because if we discover impending catastrophes accompanying um, uh, increases in temperatures, if we uh, uh, discover th them, even if we cut back to zero, it's not enough time maybe to, uh, to act on. There's nothing instantaneous. Now, let me, I'm going to close with two other problems, controversial problems, in slightly more detail. I want to go into a couple of subjects now. Uh, one is catastrophic climate change. I'll just repeat mostly or change in the language what the problem is. The problem is, it, from my, here again, it's my point of view, and I introduced the preface to that. The thing to really worry about are these uh, events that occur with a low probability but not negligible that are catastrophic in their impacts. That is what 
uh, I think when, when we assert in the models, that drives a lot of the analysis. So there's just a lot of uncertainty. Suppose X is climate change damages uh, with, a, with a probability uh, of P of X. The question is, how fast does P of X go to zero as X goes to infinity? So as the damages get bigger and bigger, what is happening to these probabilities? They are getting smaller and smaller, but how rapidly are they going to zero? And there's a distinction now being made often between thin-tailed distributions like the normal. The normal distribution is of the form e to the minus X squared. It's a bell-shaped thing that goes very rapidly to zero. Right? Right, that's not going to, uh, in that case, we're not worried so much because the probability is crashing as the X is getting bigger. There are other fat tail distributions like polynomial or Pareto distributions where there's a polynomial decline. Ah, though there also the probability is going to zero, but it's going to zero much more slowly than an exponential and uh, uh, work on these models indicates that an awful lot can write about what are the tails. Are the tails fat with probability, as we call it, which means it's polynomially declining, or are they thin with probability, meaning they're exponentially declining? And it's extraordinarily hard to figure out what's in the tails, because the only information, most of the information we have is about the median or about what on average would happen. As we go further and further out in terms of temperatures or concentrations of carbon dioxide, we naturally don't know or we know less what would be the, the probability. And what seems to now be emerging is that in some of these models, there's a lot of sensitivity to bad tails. So you've got this battle going on. Uh, the higher the temperature change, the more distant in the future it is, and the, more, the greater is the power of exponential discounting to discount it away. So it's a battle between fat-tailed catastrophes occurring uh, with uh, low but not that low probabilities versus the very powerful effect of discounting away the, effect, the uh, uh, consequences for a century or so now. Um, well, I, I'll mention a few other things. Maybe what this means we should do more research about the fatness of the extreme tails of the probability distributions. What do they look like, these extreme probabilities? There's an inherent problem here that we, the further out in the tail this is, the, the, the bigger is the, the, is the X, the less we understand what's going on. So research may not do very much to help us. Uh, with that, and that's a dilemma somehow we have to, uh, we have to live with. Now, as a, uh, a bridge to the next topic, uh, should we do something uh, like geoengineering? And let me explain that. That's another, geoengineering is another, the second thing I'll deal with in a little more detail. Um, it's another part of this, problem, which is like a problem from hell that didn't have to be there. It's complicated enough without this geoengineering stuff. This just doubles the complexity uh, of everything. So what is geoengineering? I, I, I'm sure some of you have read about it, but I think it's going to become, these issues are going to become more and more widely discussed as, as time goes on. So geoengineering is some large-scale human alteration of the climate. You might say that us pumping so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is a form of negative geoengineering. We're geoengineering the planet so that it has uh, bad uh, consequences. Now, th there's lots of examples of possible geoengineering, fertilizing the oceans, um, low, putting out solar-powered ships that spray O ocean water into the air to make low-lying clouds that reflect back uh, some, uh, uh, some of the radiation from the sun. Uh, CO2 removed from the atmosphere itself. This seems to be, uh, 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 if, uh, if you're not 
if, if you have to remove carbon dioxide and air itself, it seems prohibitively expensive uh, at this point. Uh, but that would be a form of geoengineering. Even planting trees might be a form of geoengineering. What I'm going to concentrate on now is what geoengineering is usually associated, so-called solar radiation management, SRM. Uh, so I'm going to simplistically equate the, the two. The idea of solar radiation management is that you're putting reflective particles in the stratosphere to reflect back the sunlight. You don't have to reflect back an awfully high percentage of sunlight to lower temperatures significantly in the Earth. So the, the, this, this occurs naturally in nature when, it, when a caldera, a volcanic eruption, you know, that's like everything is shot out of a cannon, uh, when, it, when, it, when there's a uh, caldera eruption like Mount Pinatuba in 1991, what it's doing is shooting, is a natural experiment that's shooting uh, sulfuric acid, uh, sulfur dioxide particles into the stratosphere. These are, these are causing other things to coalesce with them and reflects back sunlight. And the prediction is that the temperature should go down immediately. The, 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 an advantage or a disadvantage of this is that it's immediate. Uh, so when Mount Pinatubo went off, it was predicted uh, that it would result in about a half a degree centigrade for one or two years after, and that's exactly what happened. So after 1991, the temperatures went down a half a degree centigrade, so far as we can tell, for the first uh, year or two. Uh, now, then that brings the thought about what about an artificial experiment uh, of seeding the stratosphere with SO2 or even custom designed reflective uh, uh, particles. There's no reason it has to be SO2 if it's human cause. All right, here comes the part that makes this all such a complicated interaction. Uh, what I'm calling the incredible economics of geoengineering. It's incredibly cheap to do this. Uh, to lower temperatures by about two degrees centigrade globally would cost, it's hard to imagine, it would cost less than $10 billion a year, it's been estimated. You need special uh, high altitude aircraft. They need to take on board sulfur dioxide and they need to spew it out in the stratosphere. But there's not that many planes and there's not that much sulfur dioxide that's needed. And so if you want to lower the temperature by this kind of geoengineering, it's doable and it's extremely cheap. Uh, it's got a lot of downsides that, that make it not a good first line of defense against climate change. Uh, it doesn't do anything about ocean acidification, but it doesn't do anything about the carbon dioxide concentrations themselves. They stay whatever they are at, and they increase at whatever they're increasing at. It's just that there's more reflective particles reflecting back uh, the sunlight. Um, and uh, there's some ozone depletion associated with it. One of the worst things is suppose you got dependent on this somehow. You could suppose you could convince people this is a good idea. It's cheap. Uh, it lower the temperature. Okay, then something goes wrong. Uh, the weather patterns go crazy or something like that. Okay, now we want to cut back on the reflective particles. But when we do that, the temperature rises instantaneously to what it would be uh, without the geoengineering. So you, if you start on this road, if you ever have to stop it suddenly, you're up a creek. All of a sudden, you're, terror, you're worse than you were when you started out. Um, now, I, I, th I think th this is a controversial area. I think there's now a growing uh, uh, sense increasingly that we need more research in this area. We need more research among other things, even if we hate this method and it's no good and it, 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 whatever, it shouldn't be done, somebody might do it. Uh, Bangladesh could do it actually, China could do it, the US could do it, many countries or even uh, uh, individual billionaires could do this on their own. 
so we need to understand this better, and it might even have some role as a kind of a plan B if the temperatures suddenly get out of control and you want to knock them down suddenly uh, in conjunction with some plan that actually restricts carbon dioxide emissions. This could give you a breathing spell. Um, all right, so that's what I think. You need to research it. Uh, it's not a plan A, it's some kind sort of a plan B. Um, but this is co you can see how this is complicating things because what happens if there's a rogue country that wants to send up these uh, reflective particles? Who's going to stop them? Once again, this is not covered by international law. We don't have an overarching agency that coordinates policies of individual countries. Now, this makes, in some sense, this makes there a, to be a double externality. Uh, the usual externality of, uh, is the free rider problem, right, of, of restricting carbon dioxide emissions. The trouble with us getting a solution to that is that it's too expensive. No one country wants to pay for it. The problem here is what you might call a free driver uh, problem as opposed to a free rider problem. Anybody with the, with even any country even with modest means could affect the temperatures globally on its own. So these two, I call them mother-father externalities, they have opposite problems. The problem with the one is that it's too expensive. The problem with the other is that it's too cheap. Uh, so I, I don't know if this makes for twice as much difficulty for an international treatment uh, of this uh, or not, but it's another headache that uh, we don't need and we're on the uh, horns of this double externality. We don't have one ex just one externality, the one on restricting carbon dioxide, we have two. One is on restricting carbon dioxide, the other is on a, a rogue country uh, engaged in, uh, a rogue country engaged in its own version of cutting temperatures. All right, I'm going to end here. Uh, um, what is to be done? Look, I've tried to explain some aspects of why the economics of climate change is so difficult and controversial and is unlikely to come up with a unanimous opinion anytime soon about uh, what should be done. Where I do think there's universal agreement among economists is that is, is a near unanimous op opinion that the best policy for dealing with uh, carbon dioxide is to put a price on it. The problem is not the capitalist system itself or the price system itself, but that this carbon dioxide action, which is an externality, doesn't have a price associated with it. So when I consume large amounts of carbon dioxide by transportation or by any other thing, I don't personally pay for it. The, 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 the world as a whole pays for it. and. Uh, 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 the proposed solution is to have some sort of a setup with some sort of international governments where we put a universal price on carbon. That's a whole series of other stories and other lectures, but uh, that's the one thing that I think uh, all economists working in this area would, uh, would agree upon. Thank you.